here I had the privilege of visiting somebody for the pastoral visit who had just received from her doctor some very bad news. In fact, her doctor had told her that she had two months, two and a half months max to live. Now, I suppose if one is very old, like in one's early 90s, that wouldn't have been the worst news ever. But this lady was only in her mid-60s. It did home particularly hard for me because that is uh, the age of my dear mother. She had heard from her doctor that he had received back the results of her tests. And that after consulting with other medical professionals, he had learned that it's official. There was nothing that they would be able to do for her. He encouraged her to live the next 10 weeks to the best of her ability, having as much fun as possible. I journeyed with her through that two-month period, and she has now died and gone to be with Jesus. But that wasn't an easy walk. I walked with her. For if I'm honest, I most of the time didn't know what to say. On my first visit there, I remember our conversation. That's after she had called me and said, Reverend, please come and see me. I have a crisis. The conversation went to all sorts of topics, me buying my time trying to think of something that would be gentle enough for that situation. I didn't successfully come up with something, and yet she was chatting away as if it was going out of fashion. After I had been, eventually scraped together enough courage to bring up the dread topic, I jumped right in. And I said to her, Mrs. Perry, I'm so sorry to have heard about your condition. What are we going to do? She then replied with a very sly smile on her face. Ah, don't worry, Reverend. What I have is nothing that the resurrection can't fix. That moved me so profoundly, so much so that I'm haunted by those words even today. So as we observe Easter time in the church, may our hallelujahs not be empty or shallow, but may they come from a place of real conviction that Jesus is not dead, but alive. That the stone had been rolled away, his tomb might be empty, but his promise is not. We're going to read from Luke chapter 24, <clears throat> where now probably you've guessed it, the heading is the resurrection. So this is Luke's version of the story. Um, I'm always grateful that the Gospels all have their own slant when it comes to recording a particular event, for according to me, it makes the uh, event more believable and not less so. You will see in this passage, Luke mentions two angels, not only one, as Matthew does in his gospel. <clears throat> On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes, gleaming like lightning, appeared, stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces pointing to the ground. But the men said to them, why, here's the verse I'm after for today, why are you looking for the living among the dead? <clears throat> he is not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you, while he was with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must suffer 
must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and then on the third day be raised again. Then only they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to his apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to be like nonsense. Peter, however, <coughs> got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Let me take you back to that glorious Sunday morning in the New Testament when the unexpected happened. When God called a peekaboo on humanity like never before. No one had paid too much attention to Jesus' promise that he would rise again. And so everybody was in mourning, their tears running no end. For Jesus, their Lord and their life, was dead. When these women went to the tomb to embalm the body on that Sunday morning, their first thought hadn't been, oh, he might have risen just as he said. No, they were completely and utterly devastated when they didn't find the body there because the first conclusion they jumped to was somebody had taken the body. They probably knew that it wasn't the disciples with because these were sitting shivering in an upper room somewhere out of fear of the Jews, the Gospel of John tells us. So the only other option would have been the Roman authorities, just to make sure that all their bases are covered. The passage I read to us drips with confusion and mystery. It speaks volumes of just how uncertain and afraid these women must have been. Unfortunately, their first thought had not been, gosh, maybe, just maybe, he has risen just as he said he would. A few years ago, there was a pastor caught out very, very te terribly. There was a pastor here in Africa who claimed that he could raise the dead. I don't know if you remember how it was all over the media, but until we found out the truth, that was pretty impressive stuff. Because this pastor had put all his props in place, including the corpse. And some of the clips I saw were almost, <coughs> emphasis on the word almost, convincing. I remember seeing a hall packed with hundreds, if not thousands of people, with this pastor making himself ready to do the... <laughs> no, those are not my sermon notes. If they were, I'd be to just add them. What was I saying? There was this, the, this, this, this auditorium packed with hundreds, if not thousands of people, and on the center stage, to bright lights and loud music, this pastor was making himself ready to raise that particular person from the dead on that particular day. He appeared from the back door, marching in very confidently in his glittering suit. He made absolutely sure that the cameras saw every corner of the hall. There was lots and lots of suspense in the air. I don't know how much he paid the person in the coffin to look dead and then to all of a sudden look alive, but he almost got away with it. Until the investigation, of course. You know where that pastor is today? In prison, thank you very much. He was caught out 
and the police pulled his blood. I don't know if it was for the money or for the prestige or both, but he wasn't going to fool everybody all the time. You see, Jesus is the one set apart as the Lord of life, as the one who bears the name Resurrection. For he is unique in the one who conquered the grave, who jumped up from it like a jack-in-the-box when only a few were noticing. And he lived forevermore. Jesus, in other words, is one of a kind. I know that there's somebody sitting in front of me today wanting to put up their head saying, Ben, you're not entirely accurate with your assumption because there were other people in the Gospels who had also lived again, who had also been raised from the dead. People like Lazarus, for instance. People like the widow's son at Nain. Not to mention those who had been dead who were seen walking around on the Good Friday on which Jesus died. Remember we have the report of those who had been buried walking around in town almost as if they hadn't ever been dead. Now I want to know from you, where are those people today? And where are their remains? Stuffed in some lonely tombs under the ground. All of those who Jesus raised back to life died again. In fact, there's a church in Cyprus which claims to have the body of Lazarus. Jesus is the only one who lives and who lives forevermore. There are some amazing passages that took place after the resurrection. Jesus spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, appearing to as many people as possible. His 12 disciples, or 11 at the time, or if one also remembers that Thomas wasn't there, the first 10 were the lucky ones. Jesus rose from the dead in the morning, made sure that the women got a good look at him, and then, of course, that evening, there where the disciples were sitting, shaking in their shoes, he says to them, surprise, surprise. I have risen from the dead, just as I said I would. There are all sorts of other passages that make it clear to us that Jesus was seen alive, that Jesus was seen even eating some fish. Which of course brings the focus to the fact that Jesus had had a bodily resurrection. For in the early church there were some groups who claimed that Jesus' resurrection was only spiritual. The fact that he could still eat fish means that the resurrection had been physical also. That false pastor is now behind bars and Jesus the King sits on his throne at the right hand of God and lives and reigns forevermore. A few years ago, there was also the devastating news of a church in Pakistan. Now, there are many churches in Pakistan, but this particular church on Easter morning of all mornings had been bombed. And I remember how shattered I was when reading the article because I thought, gosh, do we really live in a world where somebody can stoop that low? Where you can actually attack people in their place of worship. Does this kind of raw evil exist on this planet? It clearly does, for as the worshippers gathered to celebrate the resurrection in this particular church in Pakistan, a bomb went off and many of those worshippers were killed and many of those believers were rushed to hospital and the building was rather wrecked. And I thought to myself, what kind of a world is this where the faithful cannot even gather in peace without the threat of losing I pray that no one will ever attack us 
in this sanctuary as we worship here on a Sunday morning in spirit and in truth. I really hope that no one will ever have it in their minds to plant a bomb here at United Church Hermanus. But if I don't have a choice, if ever I end up with somebody pointing a gun at me saying, Bevan, on which day would you like to be bombed? I would probably opt as the calm as the sounds for Easter Sunday. You see, that terrorist putting the bomb together and pressing the detonator just as the service was about to start thought that he had won. He thought that he had made a statement for whatever truth he believed in as a Muslim extremist. But then, if there's ever a day where the truth looms over every church building across the world, it would be Easter Sunday. For on Easter Sunday, we hold on to this unwavering fact that it doesn't matter what we go through. It doesn't matter what the world does to us as Jesus' people. We will always overcome. For Jesus is alive and not I really trust that no one will ever be as sick to try that here. But if it is to happen, I wouldn't mind if it's on Easter Sunday. On that day where we celebrate darkness turning into light. On that day where we celebrate pain turning into joy. On that day where we celebrate death turning into light. I hope that those Christians in that bombed church on that Easter Sunday took great courage. I trust that they found remarkable reassurance in this eternal truth of Easter. And I've borrowed this from a book by Max Lucado. Your life is not futile. Your failures are not fatal, and your death is not final. I trust that that truth burst into those hearts of those flattened Christians on that given Easter morning. And I trust that as they came to terms with the horrible thing that had happened to them, that they found in them <coughs> the comfort and the peace that changes lives. Years ago, when we were growing up in my parents' house in Somerset West, my brother and I tried our hand at a bit of vegetable gardening. Now, the fact that I don't like vegetables up to this day probably suggests that it was a complete and utter failure which it was. But we gave it our best attempt, however, and Dad even went as far as giving us a little patch in the backyard for us to garden in. What we didn't know at the time was that there was this tree right in the middle of the patch, as stubborn as anything. And we, my brother and I, tried month after month week after week to get rid of this tree, to uproot it, to cut it down, and we ended up hacking it quite nastily. There was nothing left of it, only a bare shortened stump. We wanted to go ahead with planting our potatoes and our carrots and our beans, mostly because those are the nicest to see growing, so by the way. Believe it or not, every single time when we went there to water what we had planted, this empty, cold stump would have started sprouting new leaves, fighting for survival. It wasn't long before my brother and I gave up our venture entirely. I did learn an important lesson however and if i have to give it one word the word would be 
resurrection. For this tree that I later learned had been given to my dad by my grandfather, the one that wanted to live. This tree taught me that there is always resurrection. That the world can bruise us. That the world can batter us. That the world can come dangerously close to maybe even breaking us. But because of the hope, the living hope I should say, we have in Jesus, there is always the possibility of a new <coughs> beginning. There might be somebody in this building today who doesn't feel the Easter vibe. Maybe your life is hard and frustrating. In fact, maybe it feels that somebody has brought a wrecking wall to your heart and you just don't know how you're going to survive. And maybe for you the road has become too long and the night too dark. Maybe you sit here having in the week choked on your loneliness. And maybe all this mumbo jumbo about Jesus being alive isn't really for you. If that is the case for you today, I pray that the moment will come, perhaps even before we leave here today, for you to open your heart to the rich resurrection power of the living Christ. For you to give him a chance to enter your heart and to spray those broken places of pain with his moody of love so that you can at last find healing and wholeness. In Romans 8 verse 18, St. Paul says these fetching words. He says, Whatever we go through here cannot and will not ever compare to the glory which awaits us. I would bury that verse in my mind if I were you. And I would hold on to it for whatever the future may bring. What you are going through whether it's illness, whether it's financial challenge, whether it's relationship problems, whatever you are going through, you need to bring that stuff and place them right at the door of the empty tomb, right there at its opening. And you need to realize that what you are facing is nothing that the resurrection cannot fix. <clears throat> I'm not doing all that badly. Hey, I'm going to quickly snuck in my uh, last point. A few years ago, we all saw those images of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris being in flames. It was a sad day for all the French a sad day for all of Europe, and perhaps even a sad day for all the world. For that building is iconic, and it means so much to so many people. I personally remember my trip to France of 10 years ago, and I was absolutely awestruck when I stepped into the Notre Dame in Paris. It had taken 200 years to build. It's been standing there on that island for 800 years, bringing in not only millions of euro as revenue, but also calling worshippers from far and wide. Can you remember how ruined we felt when we saw the roof caving in? I was particularly relieved when I heard that the organ was still okay, but that's just me. It was a sad day, particularly for those attached to the cathedral, for those who have membership there, and for those who minister there. I remember watching on TV 
an interview with the dean of the cathedral, the dean of Notre Dame. He said to the interviewer that they have to quickly decide, because the fire happened a week before Easter on Palm Sunday, they had to very quickly decide where they will worship for the Easter services. For in France, open air worship is not allowed. Evangelism is forbidden, as you know. In fact, churches are not even allowed to have nativity scenes outside, lest it offend non-believers. On this particular Easter, the government gave special permission for the Notre Dame Cathedral to have its Easter morning services outside in front of the cathedral on that vast square. And my mind immediately went, ah, this is a victory for us. Taking the gospels, the gospel outside the safety of the four walls of the church. I trust that as they celebrated Mass outside the cathedral on Easter morning, that those who were passing by had their interest piqued. And I trust that some of them even heard the name of Jesus proclaimed. What a wonderful opportunity for mission. I cannot help but wonder if we who say that we follow Jesus, if we who say that we are resurrection people, have not fallen into the safe trap of being Jesus people inside here, and sing these exciting songs that speak of his empty tomb only here inside this church. Hasn't the time come for us to tell the bleeding world outside there of the secrets we know that can lead to abundant life and new beginnings and indestructible hope? Isn't that your calling? Isn't that mine? Has that mandate not been placed on our shoulders to be shouting from the rooftops that Jesus is not dead, but that he is alive. And that he's in the business of transforming lives. Maybe next Easter, weather depending, we can have a service outside. <laughs> Who knows? We need to decide this Easter season in the church between Easter Sunday and Ascension Day. We need to decide if we are going to live our lives as Good Friday believers or Easter Sunday believers. Are we going to go out there and speak life there where there is now death? Are we going to share joy when people are writhing in pain? And are we going to let our light seep into their shadows out there? Are we going to be the ones who Jesus sends into the world, telling others that whatever they are going through, it is not something that the resurrection cannot fix?